first of all, welcome to the Old Labor Hall and happy Prima Pagia. Um, we're going to start and do things a little differently tonight because one of the singers has to leave. So we're going to start out as we often do with the song of today, the, the Internationale. Before they do that, I want to remind you that there is a silent auction. And it's in the Ambrosini room and it'll be there till seven o'clock. So you don't want to miss out. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, so make sure you check it out. Now, with the International Hero, who go in bed? Arriba, paria de la tierra, en pie famélica legión. Atruena la razón en marcha, es el fin de la opresión. Del pasado hay que hacer añicos, legión esclava en pie a vencer. El mundo va a cambiar de base, los nada de hoy todo han de ser. Agrupémonos todos en la lucha final. El género humano es la internacional. Agrupémonos todos en la lucha final. El género humano es la internacional. So we'll see it now in English with Ben. Oh, I'll do one more. Okay. En Dios se rege. Está el supremo salvador. Nosotros mismos realicemos el esfuerzo redentor para hacer que el tirano caiga y el mundo siervo liberar. Soplemos la potente fragua que el hombre libre ha de forjar. Agrupémonos todos en la lucha final. El género humano es la Internacional. So please, please join us if you know it, and Ben will do it in English, so please join us. You should have the lyrics somewhere on the table. I've said a number of times singing it here that my grandfather would be singing this in Yiddish. Hugo is singing it in Spanish. It's been sung in Chinese. It's been sung in all the languages. And there were moments when whole groups of people of different, with different languages sang it at exactly the same time. And so if, uh, if you've got some other language and you want to sing it in that, go right ahead. It's, uh, it'll work out. Arise, ye prisoners of starvation. Arise, you midst of the earth, for justice thunders condemnation. Oh, a better world's in birth. No more tradition change shall bind to a mountain slave. No more in flow. The earth shall rise on new foundation. We once were not, we shall be all. Tis the final conflict. Let it stand in their place. The international union will be the human race. Tis the final conflict. Let it stand in their place. The 
for unions, you know? We're making some progress. A president of the United States out on a picket line, you know? United Auto Workers, different places. In the South, in Tennessee, places like that. Getting contracts, it's really something. You gotta go down and join the union. You gotta join it by yourself. Ain't nobody here can join it for you. You gotta go down and join the union by yourself. It's an easy song. Help me. You gotta go down and join the union. You gotta join it by yourself. Ain't nobody here. Ain't nobody here. Can join it for you. You gotta go down and join the union by yourself. You know, you could be my echo. I'll sing you a line, you sing it right after me. So if I say, you gotta go down, you gotta go down and join the union. You gotta join it by yourself. Ain't nobody here can join it for you. You gotta go down and join the union by yourself. Papa, well, Papa's gotta go down and join the union. He's got to join, he's got to join it by himself. Ain't nobody here can join it for him. He's gotta go down and join the union by himself. Maybe sister's gonna go down, right? Sister's gonna go down. And join the union. She's got to join it by herself. Ain't nobody here can join it for her. She's got to go down and join the union by herself. You've got to go down. you got to go down and join the union. You've got to join it by yourself. Ain't nobody here. Can join it for you. Gotta go down and join the union by yourself. Well, if the road gets rough and rocky and the hills are high, they get too hot. If the hills are high, get high, get high everywhere. Get high. Um, uh, well, you, we, we can sing as we go marching. And we'll get that one big union by and by. You gotta go down. You gotta go down huh? and join the union. You gotta join it by yourself. There was nobody here to join it for you. you. Gotta go down and join the union. One last time. Come on, let me hear you sing it, all right? You ready? You gotta go down, you gotta go down and join the union. You gotta join it by yourself. Ain't nobody here can join it for you. You gotta go down and join the union by yourself. Ben Koenig, and before him, Hugo Martinez. Thank you both. And now, folks, soup song. So, try to be orderly and respectful of each other, but go get the soup. If you need someone to bring it to you, wave your hand, or scud. We have people who will do that. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Um, we're running a little late, so um, I thought that I would go through the announcements if I could. Um, your dessert is going to be brought to your table, so um, you should be able to sit for a while. Um, someone left these glasses on the back table. Anyway, they'll be on the front table at, at the end of the time if they're yours. 
And um, we have a very special birthday tonight. Um, anybody else have a birthday we don't know about? So the mayor has a dog who's one year old, and his name is Primo Doggio. <laughs> I don't think he did it for political reasons because he's not running again, but it's a fabulous, wonderful name. So happy birthday to Primo. Yeah. And um, I know it, yeah. Primo Doggo is waiting at home I see. for his first birthday birthday cake. Got it. And I also wanted to recognize um, the mayor, Jake Hemrick, and also Peter Anthony, our state legislator. Peter, I saw you. Um, are, are there any other elected officials here that we should recognize? OK, but we're really, really happy that you're here. Um, this should have been an early announcement. Um, the bathrooms are downstairs. Um, if, you, if you need an elevator, Carolyn, where are you? Okay, Carolyn will take you down on the elevator rather than the stairs. It's a new lift, it's not quite working. It's totally safe, but it's a little bit complicated how it, it's a little bit complicated how it gets, how it works. Okay, so also um, we, were, we were devastated by the July flood, over $120,000 damage so far. And um, so when you go downstairs, it's clean, it's sanitary, but it's not the way it used to be, which it just isn't quite there yet. So your patience with that, please. Um, so I have a few announcements to make. First, we had a lot of donors um, for the Primo Maggio dinner. Um, AR Market, Berry Rotary Foundation, Bragg Farm Sugar House, Campo Divino, Emsley's The Florist, um, Fox Market, Hannaford Supermarket, Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, Mangy's Bakery, Quality Market, Rise Up Bakery, and Taste Vermont um, Charcuterie and Catering. And I have to say, I've been here, yeah, thank you to all of them. And, you know, this, I've, I've learned since I moved here about 15 years ago that Barrie is really that kind of community. I mean, it's really quite amazing. And um, we um, lost my train of thought, sorry. Anyway, um, so we also have a lot of donors to the silent auction. And the silent auction will be closing as I close out my remarks so that we can get it organized and ready for you guys when you're ready to go home. Um, we have some programs that we want to tell you about. Um, on the back table, there is a sheet like this that we decided that in 2024, most of us want to do something. And um, so these are action-oriented programs. We had one on um, expanding Medicaid in Vermont last month. Um, this month, Migrant Justice is coming on um, May 19th to do um, something to help with the Milk with Dignity Hannaford campaign. If you don't know, um, Hannaford's one of the few supermarkets that has not yet signed on to Milk with Dignity. Um, and on June 9th, we have a Pride political teach-in. Um, on July 18th, the Secretary of State is coming to talk about disinformation in elections, and so on. And you'll see that whole list on the back table. And also, um, we're part of something called the, um, the Global Labor Film Network. And um, this coming week, May 1st through 4th, um, we're, they're showing a film free online um, on the 1970 postal workers strike. So if any of you want to um, find out how to tune into that, there's a little flyer. It looks um, like this on the back table and you can just pick one up and it gives you the URL to tune into. And you can tune in any time between now and the fourth when it, when it ends. Okay. Um, we also, um, let's see, um, want to tell you about a few special programs that we have coming up on July 25th. 
the first night of um, of the Berry Heritage Festival, um, we always sponsor something called Soiree Sucre. It's a French Canadian um, dessert and dance and music um, evening here. The desserts are decadent. I mean, really, true. I mean, and it's delicate decadence actually that caters it. Um, and um, we ask you all to think about joining us. We have a French Canadian um, group of youth that are going to um, add to the regular dancing and singing that go on with that. And there's also a um, French pastry contest, a baking contest. Ellen Sivert, where's Ellen? Ellen has won the last several years, so thank you, Ellen, for your contributions on that. Um, and let's see. Yeah, please. Um, Clear, finish with the auction if you can. Um, and the last, um, just trying to find it. The last thing that I wanted to say before um, we get to our speaker is that April 28th every year is Workers Memorial Day around the world, um, where we remember workers that have died at work. And um, they're all mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and, um, we really need. We really. We really need to remember there were um, over 5,000 American work, or well, workers in the United States that died in an in an injury at work. There were over 120,000 that died from an occupational illness. Um, we want to remember, especially I think, um, around the world, all the journalists and all the aid workers, especially in Gaza, that have died this year. We want to remember the six workers on this Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore that, um, that died as immigrants to this country working hard and losing their life at night. Um, so we all know in Barrie that Silica killed thousands. And um, so Workers Memorial Day should be a special day, I think, for all of us. OK, um, with that, you all didn't come to hear me, you came to hear our speaker. And our speaker um, is Robin Hazard Ray. She's an independent historian. She's an essayist. She's a crime fiction writer. And that's a wonderful combination, don't you think? Kind of intriguing. And as, as, the, um, as, the, as this says, the talk, title of her talk is The Death at the Labor Hall. And we all know that was Ilya, Ilya Corti. And it's um, the um, Ilya Corti and the Konica Sovarsiva um, Il Politario feud. So with that, um, I'll let, um, I'll let um, do her own introduction and um, enjoy. Thank you very much. Okay. I I think I'm all mic'd up. Are we ready to go? Okay. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Karen Lane and uh, Paul Heller for inviting me here. Um, Karen Lane actually wrote me a physical letter in the mail with a stamp. That gets your attention, my friends. Uh, <laughs> um, so a little about my background. I actually I studied geology as a student in college. Um, and, but after a stint working in the oil fields in North Dakota, I decided I was driving a dynamite truck there. And I decided that <clears throat> my life would be longer if I went into publishing. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. Um, and I spent the next uh, 20 or 30 years, I did a lot of editing of art books, uh, architecture, architectural history, things like that. Um, and I found that the place where my, my interests really started to vibrate was at the intersection of geology, history, and art. And to me, that means a cemetery. Um, and I love cemeteries. I visit them all over the world and the country whenever I can. Um, <clears throat> and of course, Hope Cemetery was on my list. Um, I guess I first came here maybe 
I would say the late 90s or around 2000 and was just blown away by Hope Cemetery and the amazing uh, art that lives there. Um, to me, con cemeteries convey so much about what a community loves and values and what they uh, choose to prefer, uh, preserve in stone, like this beautiful monument. Um, this monument inspired me to dig deeper into the story of 1903. Can I have this next slide, please? So Elia Corti, who is in that, um, that beautiful monument, died uh, on October 4th, 1903, after being shot right here in this hall. Um, and I was just fascinated, like, what was going on here? Um, at first, I only knew that Cordy had been shot uh, in an altercation between the Italian anarchists and the Italian socialists in Barry, Vermont. And all of those things blew my mind, right? Italians in, in uh, Vermont were, you know, something I didn't know anything about. But um, as I grew uh, more interested in the story, I realized I had to go to Italy. I also had to learn to read Italian. I don't speak it very well, but I did learn to read it. Um, <clears throat> and to finding out everything that I could about the various actors who were involved in this, uh, this drama. Um, Karen Lane led me immediately to the Italian anarchist editor and agitator Luigi Galliani. Um, and later I learned about the involvement of the socialist editor and organizer, Giacinto Menotti Serrati. So in tonight's talk, we'll be moving back and forth between the United States and Italy, just as these protagonists moved back and forth. Uh, we'll first meet Elia Corti and chart his path to Barry. Uh, we'll look at the anarchist group in Barry and its roots in the Carrara marble quarrying area of Italy. Um, then we'll meet the anarchist Luigi Galliani and talk about how he came to the United States and then to Barry. Um, and we'll meet the socialist editor Serrati uh, and look at the roots of his rivalry, which was both political and personal with Galliani, both in Italy and in the United States, especially in and around the New Jersey city of Patterson. And finally, we'll look at how the convergence of these three men here at the labor hall led to such a terrible outcome. Next slide, please. So uh, the area of Italy that we're gonna be talking about is all, it's all up in the north. It's in the provinces of Piedmont, Lombardy, and Liguria. Next slide, please. Um, so let's start with Elia Corti. <clears throat> he was born, oop, back up, there yeah, we go. Um, he was born in 1869 in a village in northern Italy called Viju. Anybody here have family who was from Viju? It's a very small place. It's near Varese. Many more of you probably have a family who is from Varese. It's in the, the hills. There you go. Ambrosini's, yay. Um, in the hills above Milan. Uh, next slide, please. So Viju is called the village of the Picassas. And I couldn't figure out what this meant until I went there and I asked somebody and he said, ah, ah, così, peek, peek, peek. Um, it was so full of stone carvers uh, that there was just the noise of stone carving was a constant um, din. Uh, and you can see this is just a random doorway. I, you know, I happen to like this one, had a lot of things, but you can see every surface is decorated with little carved stuff, probably commissions that didn't quite work out and therefore were left in the village. It's a little surprising because the stone itself is kind of this, it's this sort of garbagey sandstone. I get to judge, I'm a geologist. Um, it's really not very, I mean, it's not like, it's not like the Barry Gray. Um, but it, it was uphill from Milan, which meant that they could quarry it, shape it, and, uh, and transport it downhill. Downhill, very important. Uh, especially in the age before railroads. Um, Corti was a gifted student. Can I have the next slide? 
Uh, and as a teenager, he was accepted for art training at the prestigious Academia di Brera in Milan. Very fancy place. It's covered with graffiti now, but it's still fancy. Um, but Italy in this period was a mess, uh, both economically and politically. Although the country was a unified, um, technically speaking, in the 1860, it remained very unstable with outbreaks of rebellion and widespread dis, uh, disaffection. Um, the country experienced several swings toward greater democracy and reform, followed by reaction and repression. Uh, popular anger toward the state drew many followers to radical political philosophies such as socialism, communism, and anarchism. And thousands fled the country rather than be drafted into the army. So uh, Cordy was among those who emigrated in this period. He applied for a passport in 1889 at the age of 20. By this time, there were a number of men from his village of Viju and also from Varese who had found work at the Berry Quarries. Uh, so this is where he came. His arrival more or less coincided with the establishment of an anarchist cell here in Berry. We don't usually know a whole lot about it because they didn't have a newspaper. Um, anarchism is usually defined as a political philosophy that sets itself against any form of authority, including governments and religions. Uh, it regards property as theft. Uh, voting is generally regarded as a validation of the state and therefore corrupt. Um, many anarchists find even labor unions to be problematic because they tend toward hierarchy and the accumulation of uneven power. The universal symbolism of anarchism is a capital A inscribed in a circle. Um, but for the roots of the Barry anarchist cell, we really have to reach back again to Italy and to the marble, region, uh, marble quarrying region of Carrara. So the Carrara is on the Ligurian coast here, a little bit to the south and west of where uh, these other folks are from. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the mountains above Carrara are blessed with a variety of beautiful marbles, the most precious of which is the Bianco. It was first exploited by the Romans and has been prized by generations of sculptors, including Michelangelo on the left and Bernini on the right, for its brilliant white color and its fine, even texture. You can see in this incredible sculpture of Daphne and Apollo, Daphne is a nymph. Apollo is trying to have his way with her. She's not having it. And she's turning into a tree. And Bernini has, has carved her fingers turning into leaves. And they're so uh, fine and thin, you can practically see through them. This is Carrara marble. Next slide, please. Um, the white of this marble is so intense that from a distance, its quarries look like snow fields in the mountains. Um, <clears throat> the stone is cut in the hill towns like this one called Colonata, mother of columns, and Fosdinova, and exported, next slide please, uh, through the port of Massa. Here we are with these gigantic blocks of marble waiting to go to uh, various places around the world. Um, next slide please. Um, but the life of the court men <laughs> was uh, incredibly hard and very lonely. Uh, until well into the 20th century, marble workers would leave home early Monday morning and, and climb the mountains. Um, they would spend the week up in the mountains, sleeping in crude dormitories. Um, this is a watercolor by John Singer Sargent. He was very captivated by the quarries in Carrara and did a, a lot of uh, watercolor sketches there. You can see this kind of crude building up on, uh, up on the mountain there. That's the sort of place that you would have to sleep for the entire week um, and then come back and join your family on uh, uh, Saturday. Um, you know, freezing in the winter, baking hot in the summer, you can imagine. 
Um, so the, the isolation of these workers may help explain uh, why Carrara became such a, an anarchist um, stronghold uh, rather than socialism. In any case, um, next slide. Uh, signs of anarchism are absolutely everywhere in the Masa Carrara region today. Uh, this is a little um, bookshop uh, and a community center, Circolo Culturale Anarchico, where you can pick up all kinds of great literature. Um, next slide, please. And this is a, a sign in a parking lot um, up by Colonata. It says, um, next one. It says, to the anarchist comrades killed on the road to liberty. And you see the A inscribed um, in the circle. This stuff is just everywhere. Every time, everywhere you turn, there are signs of this um, allegiance to anarchism. The anarchist uh, Galileo Pala remarked that in Carrara, even the stones are anarchist. <laughs> so when the workers from Carrara immigrated to Barry, Vermont, they brought their philosophy with them. It flourished here and in a few other places in the United States, such as among the silk workers in Patterson, New Jersey, about whom we will hear more. Um, Elia Corti, newly arrived from Italy and probably pretty lonely, began associating with these Cararese uh, anarchists and was purportedly attracted to their values. He was working by day as a granite sculptor using his art school training. And by night, he was probably hanging out with the other carvers, um, most of whom were from Carrara. Uh, things went well enough for him that he sent for his fiance, Ernesta Maria Comey. I'm grateful for um, the gentleman who brought this beautiful copy. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, of this uh, family portrait of Elia Corti. He's there with his wife and uh, two of his three daughters. Um, his brother, Guglielmo, also came to Barry to work as a carver. Now, Corti and, can I have the next slide, please? Corti and his fellow Piedmontese, Sam Novelli, scored a huge success in 1899 with the commission of the Robert Burns Monument, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, Sam Novelli executed the sensitive portrait of the Scots national hero in a thoughtful uh, romantic pose, much less like the, the sort of hero model, but more romantic, beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And Elia Corti made the um, beautiful bas reliefs on the base. Uh, my favorite is this one, which depicts a scene from the Burns poem, Tam O'Shanter, about a feckless drunkard named Tam who enrages a mob of witches and has to flee over a bridge on his faithful horse, Maggie. As eager runs the market crowd, when catch the thief resounds aloud, so Maggie runs, the witches follow, with many an eldritch scratch and hollow. Ah, Tam, ah, Tam, thou'll get thy fearin. In hell they'll roast thee like a heron. Cordy has caught the moment when one of the hellions has torn off poor Maggie's tail. For Nanny, far before the rest, hard upon noble Maggie pressed, and flew at Tam with furious ettle. But little wist she Maggie's mettle. He sprang, brought her half, her master hail. I cannot do the Scottish thing there, it's too well. But left behind her ain gray tail. The carlin caught her by the rump and left poor Maggie scarce a stump. <laughs> the success of this work allowed Sam and Elia to go into business for themselves. Next slide, please. Um, here we see Elia in his shirt sleeves on the left in his workshop, uh, directing the work of many other people, including uh, this poor child here. <laughs> it was the days before child labor was a lot. Um, so it's important to note that by this time, so right around 1899, 1900, Elie had effectively changed class. He was no longer a wage worker. He was now a business owner, a padrone the figure that the anarchist sets him or herself against. 
it's possible to imagine that his enthusiasm uh, for anarchism had somewhat eroded under the changed circumstances of family and uh, business management. It's also possible that some people in the community viewed this as a defection from the cause. Lots of things we don't quite know. Now we have to go back to Italy to pick up another couple characters in the drama of October 3rd, 1903. Next slide. Um, Luigi Galliani, who lived from 1861 to 1931, was like Elia Corti from the Piedmont area in the north. If any of you uh, um, were here for the Primo Maggio talk last year, you know quite a bit about him. Um, his family was a solidly middle class. Um, he grew up in a town called Vercelli, um, which there's, I, I looked it up once in a guide and it said, it's the largest rice producer in Italy. That was the biggest thing they had to say about it. Kind of a boring place, I think. Um, Luigi entered law school in Turin, but he didn't finish his degree uh, and instead devoted himself to radical causes. Um, at first, he was a socialist, uh, but over time, he became convinced that socialism, like capitalism, inevitably led to inequalities, hierarchies, and repression, and furthermore, that the socialists were waiting passively for the revolution to appear on the horizon rather than working to bring it about. So Galliani began to advocate the, what is called the propaganda of the deed, which consisted of striking physical blows against the system and its agents, who might include kings, industrialists, or reformist republicans. Um, in 1892, at the Congress in Genoa aimed at organizing the Italian Workers' Party, the POI, Galliani and other anarchists threw the meeting into chaos by rejecting the entire socialist platform after it had already been voted on. As one journalist put it, Galliani organized the disorganization of the Congress. For this disruption, Galliani and other anarchists were bitterly resented by many socialists of the day. It's possible that his beef with the socialist Sarati began right then. Now, the 1880s saw Galliani and many other radicals crushed in a wave of government repression. Um, after a term in prison on the mainland, he was sent off to exile on the remote island of Pantelleria. I've noted it down there. It's between Sicily and Tunisia. <clears throat> it's actually closer to Tunisia. Um, um, it's a very dry, uh, barely fertile place. Can I have the next slide, please? So, you know, today it is a sun-soaked paradise. Yesterday it was a desolate prison island. <laughs> it's all, all a matter of perspective. Uh, um, while he was there, he made um, quite a name for himself with a defiant essay, which was reprinted here. Uh, it was called I Morti, The Dead. Um, this essay was smuggled off the island and published as a newspaper in Ancona. In it, he declared that rumors of the demise of anarchism had been greatly exaggerated uh, by both the reactionary government and by the socialist press. The anarchists on the island of exile were not dead, and neither was anarchism. On Pantoleria, he met uh, a married woman named Maria Rallo, with whom he eventually escaped to Egypt. They were partners for life and had uh, many children together. Um, from Egypt, he moved first to London and then to the United States in 1901. So it's useful here to give a flavor of Galliani's prose. This is an excerpt from an issue of Cronica Sovrasiva, which is later his, uh, his newspaper, the Subversive Chronicle. Um, it's an article in which his, he answers his son's question is, why am I named Balila? And here is what Galliani writes. Because in Genoa, in 1746, when the most ruthless and odious of the evil Austrian rulers and renegade nobility raged out of control, 
and the old men who had been forced to chew curses as their fodder, and the women who had long suffered enough insults to drink their own tears in silence, and the young people, full of strength, bowed their heads in despair to the insults, their kidneys to the batons. A boy, a poor boy from Porto Longo, who grew up in the open air between the sky and the sea, between misery and the rags on his back. Balila, of fervid heart, facing the daily spectacle of abused power and cowardice, felt inside himself like a rush in his blood, like a burst of flame in his face, felt all their shame, all their misery, and grabbed a stone, hurling derision at the cowards, his stone and his defiance at the police spies, setting off the December 5, 1746 insurrection that liberated Genoa from the Austrians forever. That is one sentence, my friends. <laughs> Galliani settled in Patterson, New Jersey, among the, silk, the Italian silk workers, many of whom came from the anarchist region of Biella in the Piedmont. He took control of an anarchist uh, newspaper, La Questione Sociale, and soon found himself in journalistic rivalry with none other than Giacinto Menotti Serrati. Uh, next slide, please. Serrati was born in 1872, so he's 11 years younger, younger than Galliani. Uh, Serrati's family, like Galliani's, was middle class. Uh, his father was a dealer in olive oil and had at one time served as mayor of their hometown uh, Onelia, can I have the next slide, please? Show you where Onelia. It's over um, on the uh, on the coast there. It's supposed to be very nice. Haven't been there. Um, but like Galliani, he gave up his studies in mid university. Um, he committed himself to socialism and began a long career of organizing, speaking, and writing for socialist newspapers. Like Galliani, he did time in prison and on the islands of exile, to which the Italian government liked to send its troublemakers. He was in constant motion and spent time in Madagascar, Switzerland, France, all over the place. Um, Sanati was a competent, if unexciting, writer, uh, a regular contributor to Avanti, the organ of the Social Italian Socialist Party. Um, he was the chief proponent in Italy of what was called the maximalist wing of the Socialist Party, which sought to paper over differences among various factions in order to present a united front in the struggle to overthrow capitalism. As such, he was for nearly everything that Galliani was against. Organization, hierarchy, compromise, and the vote but he had none of Galliani's charisma and certainly nothing of the latter's flair for drama in person or in prose. In addition, rumors of financial self-dealing were often attached to Sarati's name. Uh, next slide, please. Nevertheless, when the Italian-American socialist paper Il Proletario, the Proletarian, published in New York by the Socialist Labor Party, was seeking a new editor in 1901, they brought Sarati to the new world and back into the orbit of Luigi Galliani. Um, just across the Hudson River from New York, in the silk factories of Patterson, West Hoboken, and Hackensack, New Jersey, labor activists were competing for the allegiance of the silk workers. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, these workers, uh, spinners, dyers, weavers, ribbon makers, were a very mixed lot ethnically. Uh, in addition to Italians, there were Eastern European Jews, Spaniards, Germans, uh, English, and others, all toiling for pitiful wages under terrible conditions especially in the dye works. Galliani later described the dye works in Cronica Sovesiva. They are, for the most part, ignoble barracks and underground hallways with neither air nor light in which the suffocating stench of the acid, the deadly emanations of the dye baths, the perennial humidity 
rapidly undermine even the youngest and most robust of constitutions, and it takes but a few months to turn a man into a squalid and pitiable shadow. <clears throat> the year 1902 was a catastrophe for Patterson. A devastating fire in February destroyed nearly 500 buildings. A record-breaking flood followed in March. You all know about that. Um, many workers were laid off or had their wages cut. And periodic strikes began to break out in April, with the dyers walking out first. On the 18th of uh, June, 1902, the anarchists held an international rally across the river from Patterson in Halladen, New Jersey, with speakers addressing the crowd in English, German, and French. But the barn burner was Luigi Galliani. Here is an eyewitness report. Um, so after William McQueen had addressed the relatively few English speakers, a voice cried out, Vogliamo Galliani, Vogliamo Galliani, we want Galliani. Thousands of voices echoed in turn, Galliani, Galliani. Luigi Galliani, editor of La Questione Sociale in pa of Patterson, mounted the dais. The enthusiastic hurrahs redoubled, and the crowd seemed for a moment transformed into a tempestuous ocean of upraised arms, waving hats, newspapers, handkerchiefs, and canes. All at once, a hush fell on the assembly. Galliani began to speak. I have never heard an orator more impressive than Luigi Galliani. He possesses a marvelous facility with words, accompanied by a rare faculty in a demagogue, precision and clarity of ideas. A voice full of warmth and a lively, penetrating gaze, gestures of exceptional vigor, and at the same time, an impeccable refinement. He spoke only in Italian, naturally, with a slight Lombard accent, but the English and French workers who were among the crowd that day followed his speech with utmost attention, as if they grasped every one of his words. A rabble thirsting for blood and gold, Galliani began, has long exploited your labor, O comrades. For them, it is wealth and luxury. For you, poverty and shame. And while your veins are sapped of their vitality, the coffers of your bosses overflow with gold. With that gold, your bosses will amass fortune upon fortune, and they will even, as always, alas, buy the conscience of the miserable wretches whom they pay to kill themselves. Are you going to let this go on? Comrades, rise up. Amid the applause of the strikers, Galliani descended from the dais. The local newspaper later reported, in a twinkling, a big mob of foreigners was at his heels. <clears throat> they moved from mill to mill, calling on the workers inside to join the strike and vandalizing mills where the workers would not come out. The police were called in, the strikers were assaulted with fire hoses, and general mayhem ensued. Uh, I love the, the mob's awful work, great headline. Um, several people, including Galliani, were wounded by gunfire. Uh, Galliani fled then to Canada, a fugitive from justice in New Jersey. But a year later, he eased himself back over the border into the anarchist-friendly community of Barry, where he lived under an assumed name. Next. On June 6, 1903, he published the first issue of Cronaca Sorversiva, which was to become the longest running Italian language anarchist newspaper in the United States history. He employed a local, uh, a talented local artist, Carlo Abate, to design the beautiful masthead, uh, which remained one of its strongest features through many changes of design. Even before this, however, the battle of the newspapers was on. Already in April 1902, Galliani was calling Sarati out by name in the pages of La Questione Sociale. Sarati goaded him back in the pages of Il Proletario, 
blaming the anarchists for the violence in Patterson and the failure of the strike. In August 1902, two months after the events in Patterson, Galliani wrote in La Questione Sociale, Mr. Sarati, caught with his hands in the till and aiding with his denunciations and pronouncements the work of yellow journalism and the tasks of the Patterson police, was planning to flee from the consequences that ensued from his livid sectarian anger and the failure of his premeditated and recurrent hypocrisy. Ouch. Uh, on it went, back and forth, through the period of the silk workers' strike in Patterson and Galliani's departure for Canada and then Barry. On December 28, 1902, six months after the events in Patterson, Sarati published in Il Proletario an article about the uh, Italians of Barry, Vermont. Uh, two thirds of the way down the article, he wrote the following The Italians of Barry are, for the most part, subversives. Still are, I'm sure. Uh, this is confirmed by their skepticism toward Catholic priests who, while finding good candidates among the Canadians and the Irish, discovered to their regret that their fellow Italians have deserted the church en masse, and horrors do not even report them to them for the baptism of children. The first of the colony to arrive were those from Varese, many of whom had been won over to the socialist faith, and they founded a socialist section. From Massa and Carrara come the anarchists. The life of the colony, that is the Italian colony, up to now has often been disturbed by the very lively polemics between two parties, which invite now and again Gori, Malatesta, Galliani, Rondani, and others for adversarial discussion. So this rather bland statement, possibly in combination with other intelligence, led the anarchists to conclude that Serati was deliberately trying to rat out uh, Galliani's whereabouts so that the New Jersey officials could come and arrest him. It was hence that Serati began to be called uno spio, a spy, and was given the nickname Pagnaca after a man who allegedly infiltrated our anarchist groups in the New York area and reported on their activities to the Italian consulate there. Now, moving ahead to October of 1903, Galliani is settled in Barrie, publishing his newspaper, Cronaca Soversiva. Sarati is still at the helm of Il Proletario, but his tenure there is coming to an end. Whether this is because he was doing a bad job or because he longed to return to Europe depends on which source you consult. Sarati claims to have been invited by the socialists of Barry to give a farewell lecture at the wonderful Socialist Labor Hall. Handbills were circulated through town. Can I have the next slide, please? Maybe not. I think it's changed here. Oh dear. Well, let's see. Pushing buttons. <laughs> okay. It's just a picture of the labor hall. I thought we could all go ooh and ah because that's where we are. Um, uh, so uh, night falls in October very early, as you know. Um, handbills have been circulated through town inviting all workers to a lecture entitled Metodi della Lotta Socialista, Methods of the Socialist Struggle, set for 7 p.m. on October 3rd, 1903. Sarati, arri oh there we are, great, um, arrives in town the night before and lodges with a socialist from Varese named Alessandro Garetto. From later news reports, we know that Garetto, meanwhile, has bought a pistol and two boxes of ammunition from two different stores. Night falls early uh, down the street from the labor hall at 37 Granite Street, which I guess is this way. A number of men had gathered after attending the funeral of Rachel Milani, a, the teenage daughter of um, some Italian friends. One of them was Elia Corti. At the labor hall, the hour of seven comes and goes with no sign of the promised speaker. 
a large number of anarchists have accepted the invitation to Sarati's lecture. According to later reporting in the Barry, Barry Daily Times, the younger anarchists, including Corti's brother, Guglielmo, began to jolly the socialists at his non-appearance. Taunts escalated to shouts. Shouts led to shoving, mostly, mostly at the back of the hall. It's you guys over there. You, no shoving. Um, one man pulled a knife. Someone else picked up a chair. Alessandro Garetto reached for his hip. Elia Corti, who that moment, the moment before, had come up the front steps of the hall and down the hallway, raised his hands for calm. Instead, Garetto let fly three shots. One of them hit Elia Corti directly in the stomach. Bystanders grabbed Garetto and threw him down the front steps. The gun mysteriously disappeared. Bleeding heavily, Corti was sent by ambulance to the hospital in Montpelier, where he lingered for a day. But the bullet had pierced both walls of his stomach and lodged near his spine. His fate was sealed. Was Elia Corti the intended victim? We will never know. At his later trial for murder, Garetto remained, uh, maintained a stubborn silence as to his motives for bringing a gun to the labor hall. Ultimately, he served eight years for manslaughter, not murder, and emigrated, re emigrated to Italy, where he died. But the anarchists were in no doubt that the intended target of Garetto's bullet was Galliani himself. The Cronaca Sovversiva asserted that Sarati was, in fact, at the hall when the fracas began, waiting in the shadows for Galliani to appear and that furthermore, he had mingled outside with the Barry police. Galliani's newspaper published a highly colored uh, account of the tragedy, calling out Sarati as not only a spy, but also an assassin, spia ed assassino. On the, uh, in the October 10th issue of Cronica Soversiva, uh, he wrote, the base campaign of obscenities, insults, and opprobrium launched by a local newspaper ever since Cronica Soversiva appeared has finally effected a tragic epilogue. It was the tragic day that plunged into mourning two old, poor old people, a holy mother, and three unknowing children who will no longer feel the touch of their father's caresses. The obscene paper, which under the mask of his sacred title, that would be Il Proletario, has heaped infamy on our best comrades, called the Barry anarchists liars, thieves, and assassins. Here came the hideous murderer, the horrible henchman, to fire up anger and disagreement, to accomplish his cane-like job of fratricidal provocation. The story includes the final, this final flourish. Elia Corti, after a day of tears and agony, forever closed his eyes to the light, forgiving the mindless brute who cut his life short, but not the cowards who armed his murderous hand. However, Elia Corti's widow and his brother, Guglielmo, disputed this rendition of events. In a crisp letter to Cronaca Servasiva, printed in the November 21st edition, they wrote, Elia Corti did not pronounce a word that could even remotely be reinterpreted in the sense that you articulated, which could give substance to the fantastic myth that you recounted and recapitulated in the last issue of Cronaca Servasiva. He maintained to the last the, psalm, the calm serenity, the force of his spirit that was his nature. He died without forgiving either Alessandro Garetto, his killer, or those who had clandestinely armed his murderous hand. The outpouring of grief and sympathy for Corti's family was tremendous. As he lay dying, Corti asked that there be no priest at his funeral and no band. The Barbary Argus reported, 
In the neighborhood of 200 men walked in line ahead of the hearse, and the string of carriages covered nearly three quarters of a mile, showing the deceased was esteemed pretty highly among the Italians. Stone carvers from all over the area helped to execute the design of the beautiful monument that now stands in Hope Cemetery. Sarati lost his battle with Galliani. He was arrested for involvement with the Corti murder, though he denied being anywhere near the labor hall when Corti was shot. Eventually, although he was exonerated and released while Garetto was imprisoned, he had to return to Europe. And there, he struggled to find a place for himself in the socialist movement. Everywhere he went, anarchists would show up and start, chout, start to chant Pagnaca or Spia et Assassino. You can sort of see how they would get it going. Uh, eventually, he, um, yes, he, he rejoined the socialist newspaper Avanti, uh, but the name Pagnaca followed him so closely that when his comrades at Avanti afforded him a tribute volume in 1920, this is the thing pictured on the left there, they put the name right on the cover, Autobiography of Pagnaca, presumably with irony. At Avanti in this period was an up and coming, next slide please, young socialist named Benito Mussolini. Yeah, that's a nice protege to have. Um, Galliani, meanwhile, continued publishing the Cronaca Subversiva for another 15 years. He was ultimately deported during the Red Scare of 1917 to 18. He died in 1931 at the age of 73 in the village of Capriliola, not far from Carrara. His grave there is marked with a rough monument, which is, of course, made out of Carrara marble. Next slide, please. Cordy's family struggled after his death uh, the youngest daughter, Maria, died in March 1908 at the age of 12. <clears throat> His widow, Maria, married Elia's brother, Guglielmo, a couple of months later for reasons unknown. Um, Guglielmo himself died not many years later. One daughter married locally and is known to a number of people here. Um, the other, along with the widow, Maria, moved back to Italy where they endured the devastation of World War II both returned here after the war and are buried at Hope Cemetery. It's noteworthy that the doctor who performed the autopsy on Elia Corti detected signs of disease in his brain, lungs, and kidneys, which are consistent with the symptoms of silicosis. It's likely that his time on earth would have been short, even if he had not been shot in this labor hall. Here on his monument, we can see it's actually a little hard to see, but there's a pneumatic hammer, the power tool that gave so many granite carvers a path to prosperity, but also a death sentence with its cloud of deadly dust. And thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Yes. Uh, just, a lot of the carvers are coming from Carrera, having worked in Mar. Uh, why do they not go someplace that actually mined marble? And how was the, how did they manage the change from marble, which I think is relatively soft, to dealing with granite? Uh, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's, that's, you, would you like to answer that? <laughs> I'll tell you the difference between marble. Marble is lifelike. 
granite is dead, <laughs> especially any granite. It doesn't matter whether it came from Africa or China or Barry, Vermont. That's the difference between the two stones. And I'm, I've been doing it all my life, and I've been at it for <laughs> 64, 65 years. So I guess I got to know a little about it. So I guess I would add that um, so a number of the stone carvers were first recruited to Vermont to proctor. Uh, where they have marble. But the marble there, uh, it's not quite as good as the Carrara marble. I would say that may be an understatement. It's not that great, and there's not that much of it. Um, and so these uh, uh, Italians, I think, were looking for work. They had come over here hoping to work in marble, and um, work opened up in the, uh, the carving sheds in Barrie, and they just had to adapt. It coincided also with the, um, the invention of the pneumatic hammer, which I think was 1892. And that changed everything, because then you had a, you had a power-driven bumper. Uh, so you didn't have to uh, hammer it quite as hard. The machine could do that for you. Um, the other difference is, chemically speaking, marble, um, is made of calcium carbonate, which is, you know, we have calcium carbonate in our bones. It's something our bodies know how to deal with to some degree. It's not, still not great to work in clouds of it. Um, silica is a different matter. Um, and in the cold weather here, they were suddenly working in, uh, in, not in the open as they could do in the warmer climate of Italy, but in these closed workshops with the dust just swirling around. Hope that answers your question. Yes. I take it that uh, it's your view that Cody was shot by accident. That is my view. Yes, uh, he happened to be across the hall, uh, across the way at this, um, and I, I checked the death certificate. There was there was indeed a funeral that day for this child. Um, I think he really wasn't messing with politics much at that point. He was worried about his brother getting involved in some fracas. So he came over to see what was going on. And I think he just happened to be in the line of fire. Two other people, I mean, there was one other person. I think one of the bullets just went into the wall. Another guy, uh, he was very lucky. He got the bullet right between his sweater and his arm. He's <laughs> a lucky man. Uh, but I, you know, I think he was just, you know, I think he was just firing randomly. That's, that's my supposition. Anyone else? Yes. I'll tell you, I'm a sculptor. She's a tool maker. <laughs> you know, any of you could be a tool maker. So there is a resent because I you temper the tools and being a sculptor you always complain and to me to tell you the truth I believe that it wasn't a random shooting it was premeditated that the sculptor killed the tool maker because to me as you say, it's not that it's a lower class, but you got a chip on your shoulder. Being a supreme sculptor and complaining constantly to the tool maker, and you try to tell me that he was accidentally shot, I don't believe it. <laughs> you know? I think that, um, I guess we can split the baby. Uh, so I believe that 
Alia Corti was not the original target. No, I that, think that, that's a bunch of nonsense. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. As we see, this is a sensitive topic. Um, if anyone else has any questions for me, I think I will just say thank you very much. Thank you.